All right, so um, welcome everyone. Thank you for, for coming out on such a beautiful evening. It's always a beautiful evening, Saskatchewan. I, I just don't get it. Um, so Ian, when I asked him for his bio, he sent me two versions of his bio. Oh. I put up the official version, but I thought I'd read the unofficial version because it's far more entertaining. So as a feral, a feral child, Ian was raised by giant slots. He went on to be a founding member of the boy band Boys to Dens for You. He was the deep one. Uh, and then enjoyed a career as Canada's top underwear model, specializing in size extra small. Since retirement, Ian has fallen into a life of quiet, pastoral squalor. And, um, and otherwise, he was the CFO of Service Credit Union, the third largest credit union in Canada, uh, and, um, and a really entertaining and thoughtful and um, brilliant guy. So Ian, come on up and okay. do your thing. All right. Thanks, Mark andre um, I'll make sure I don't get all these shuffling noises all over before people are recording it. Um, so when Mark andre and I were talking, I shared with him some of the stuff we were doing at Service Credit Union. Uh, and mainly, of course, it was the stuff that was working. Uh, and he said, people might be interested, not just in what you're doing, but also the, the how, the why, and, and things like that. Because it is an interesting journey that, that, that's got us there. And sort of like the title says, we've been, and if anybody who deals in the cooperative sector has been on this journey of, is my difference meaningful, right? I, I know I should be meaningful as a cooperative, but in the end, does it, does it matter? If I went away, would anybody care? As a cooperative, do I do anything different than somebody else does, or do we just convince ourselves that we do? And so as, as service, we were, we were going through a very similar uh, journey. Now, what moves this deck forward? It's over here, sorry. Okay. This well, will be, this will be recorded. That slide for ages. There. This is a little dynamic portion. All right. So the, no, we're going to sprint through. Uh, so uh, for anybody who's worked with the government, worked with the co-op, whatever, this very similar journey, we, we all go on it. I don't know if there's any in that space who could say, ah, this hasn't been an issue for us. It just happens. It's easy. We're good at it. Um, as the people who had to suffer through my conversation in the class uh, earlier today will know, part of my speech is it's hard. Uh, this is not the easy thing. It's a competitive environment. Whatever you're doing, somebody else is always countering it. And the end result is even when you take three steps forward, they've, they've taken two or three with you. And suddenly where you thought you'd open up space between you and them, you haven't actually. And so it's, it's a very difficult dynamic. It is hard to get the market to react. And I don't, I don't know about you, but one of our weaknesses for ages was we then proceeded to lecture the market on what was wrong with them, that they didn't get us, right? We're this good. The problem isn't that we aren't doing the right things, it's that they don't get it. And then we go to the, I've got to educate them with this. And of course, with time you discover, it's not them, it's you. Uh, and, and you have to adjust to it. So the, the, the end result was a stronger awareness. And that's really what grew over time and, and, and carries part of this journey with us as well. This whole thing of, you know, if the market isn't reacting, my cooperative, my credit union, isn't doing enough of it, whatever it is. The differentiation isn't strong enough. It's not them, it's not the education, it's not the marketing, it's us. We haven't made significant enough differentiation. We haven't worked hard enough on it yet. So uh, the basic concept, my beloved enough slide, which is the difference between a cooperative and a, and a profit maximizing, a credit union and a bank is, there is such a thing as enough. And then when you get to enough, whatever's beyond that, you get to be a credit union, you get to be a cooperative, you get to make a difference that the other people didn't. This is the place where suddenly, this is why you matter. This is why you came in, this is why your members created you. It was, it's that space above they created for you. Below that, you're just running a, a, a company. You gotta make enough money to stay in business, you gotta make enough money to open the doors and keep the lights on, you gotta do all those kinds of things. The stuff, the, 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 the bar above is, is, is where the magic happens. Uh, I just like this picture and so it amuses me, but it, you know, the, the, the argument seems so obvious, right? You go to people saying, is this how you want to be treated? And they go, no, well, deal with credit unions. But the reality is, it's not that stark of a contrast. It looks like a compelling case, but reality tells you it can't be true. If it was true, cooperatives would be the dominant model in the world, and they aren't. They are the smaller of the partners in the equation, not the bigger of the partners. And so, for all of that little story about enough and the sheep and everything else, and we all nod and go, absolutely right. That isn't the truth as the world experiences it. Because if it were, right, then others would be coming to us saying, well, why can't we be more like you? And instead, the joint stock companies go, do you exist? Uh, when we deal with governments, they go, what are you again? Uh, and that tells you once more, you know, let, let, I've got a little slide that gets there. Maybe I've got it already. Um, no, it's a cooperative one of them. Uh, the idea that we have the potential to change the world, but we're not doing it. 
here and there, bits and pieces, we make a difference, and it's good. I love that we're doing that kind of thing. But you know, on a scale of 1 to 10, and people in class heard this, we used to say, in, in terms of us living our potential as a cooperative, we're a 5, a 4. And if we can get to a 7, that would be just magic. Um, but very few of us are, are in that 7, 8, 9 category of living your potential. And you, you can tell I'm beating this to death. Uh, you look at the world, it's going to tell you if you're successful. If you have to keep telling yourself that you're successful, you already got your message. So for service, some background on us. Our strategy was shaping fin member financial fitness. Right? Most institutions have something along it, but it's the whole point of helping the member become more fit financially, because we know this is a big problem in the world, and we know ultimately that the members created the credit to a certain extent to that, for that outcome. Their feeling was that they, they were not being helped financially into the state they needed to be by the joint stock companies, and they created their credit units to do that. Uh, our strongest cooperative difference was sharing of profits. Many credit unions do it in many different ways. It can be the deal on the street in terms of the best price right, right up front. It can be social differentiation. It can be environmental different. There's all kinds of ways to lay off that enough and then be on to the difference to, to do it. For us, the big deal was we shared our profits. At the end of the year, we looked at how much we had and we said, this is how much we need for enough. Here's how much you get back as a result. We've done it for about 25 years to get a sense of proportion. If you are a member with a $250,000 mortgage, you're getting about $400 a year back from us. Uh, consistently, we don't, it doesn't jump around. We're quite consistent. It's a, a, a certain payout of, of interest or now we've gone to a, a payout on balance, which is even easier to understand. But we, it's, it's not like 400 one year, 200 the next, 900 the next. It's a pretty constant number because we recognize that when you lose consistency, you lose attention. What they tend to remember was the worst experience they had, not the best. And so we just keep it steady along there. So once more you look and go, that, that seems compelling. No, nope. Uh, our growth really wasn't any different than market. Uh, matter of fact, most of the time we dialogued with our employees who were facing the, the membership, facing the world, they said, oh, if you want to grow, you've got to have a better price. Hold on, let me get this straight. I got to give them 400 bucks and have a better price. Otherwise, they're not interested in dealing with it. Which raises the question going, well, if the better price is what brings them around, what's the profit sharing doing? Does it do anything? Uh, and, and you can, and no one's ever going to say, don't give it to me. But the question is, is it driving an outcome? Is it making us a stronger financial institution than we were a year from now so that we can make more difference a year from now? Or is it one of these of, sure, I'll take it, whatever. Right? It's like the free pen at the car dealership going, oh, okay. Uh, I'll take it, but it doesn't really change. I'm not buying a car because you gave me a pen. Although psychology says you're more likely to. <laughs> Strangely enough, because we're such weird animals. And so it basically is the thing of saying, you know, listen to the data. This is one of my pet peeves in the world. Carrie is aware of, of, of manipulating the data. Another expression is they use, they use statistics as a drunk uses a lamppost for support rather than illumination. It, it, are you using the data to tell you what you want to hear? Are you willing to let it tell you the truth? And the truth it was telling us was our 25, 30 million year in profit sharing wasn't making that much difference. They were basically saying, give me better pricing or, or, or I'm not going to deal with you. And there, there was problems with better pricing, including how much better they wanted. You know, that it, it, it would not leave us making enough money to, to stay in business. So if the members weren't reacting, we aren't making the difference we think we are, so we listened to the data and, and kind of stood back. And so, so we loved we loved what we did. The people in the company, the employees loved sharing the profits. It was all wonderful. And you do build goodwill. But again, the measure was, are they going to change their behavior? If they're not changing their behavior, what was the impact you were truly having on the world? If they can't be bothered to bring you a term deposit, if they can't be bothered to bring you the checking account, if they can't be bothered, it was a nice to have, not a differentiator. Because a differentiator means it's noticeably different than somebody else. And as I said before in one of the slides earlier, it, it's got to be compelling. If it's not compelling, then it's nice. Uh, and it's not a Canadian thing being nice. <laughs> it's so nice to be nice. So we either had, we, we stood back and said, we got, we're either going to have to take this somehow to another level, or, and this was so hard, we're going to have to walk away on it. After a quarter century in, or longer investment in saying, this, this is why we matter. We make a difference in the world because of this. To say, well, maybe we'll just stop doing it and apply the 25 or 30 million to something else. But of course, one of the questions is, and what is that? So this comes back to the root question of strategy as well of, do we have a, a meaningful strategy for that element saying, our cooperative difference will be implied in such a way that the market would rather deal with us than one of the competitors. We didn't have an alternative. We didn't have a better way that we could see that was going to give us the outcome we were looking for. 
what we were up against, we knew from long experience, was that the concept of a cooperative is very hard to communicate to people who have never dealt with one. It does not lend itself to a catchy little ad. It does not lend itself to that kind of thing. Even you know, we tried billboards, we tried radio, we tried TV, we tried, and almost all of you in the room who've had to deal in that environment have found the same thing. The market just, they, it's not their life. And after about, about four words, they start going, when's the Raptors game? Uh, and that's, that's the reality of the world. And so very hard to get across the concept of a cooperative. Profit sharing, even harder, particularly because the second bullet point is people have been taught to distrust the world and with good reason. But the end result is you're in the middle of the noise and I'll take financial institutions. That's what we do for a living. Everybody is saying, I'm here to help you. I'm here to help you. And of course, they go in and they discover they aren't necessarily here to help them. They're here to try to make money off of them and they aren't necessarily being helped. And so when you say we're here to help, they go, I heard that one before. When you say, I'm gonna give you free money, they go, yeah, right. Uh, it's very hard to get them to believe. Trust in institutions is something we talked about earlier today. There's deep distrust of most institutions in the world period. Financial institutions, I'm trying to remember now, statistically, they're somewhere below car dealers. Uh, dentists rank above in terms of where they'd rather be. And in terms of trust, I think we're down near used car dealers and financial institutions for trust. Uh, and to get a sense of this, uh, we'll talk about the pilot later, but one of the things we found is that uh, in the pilot, we approached people where we've been paying them around four or $500 a year and said, hey, uh, we'd like to do this or that. And the reaction we got from a disturbing number of members was, oh, that's right, you didn't pay me last year, did you? And then we had to go through their bank statement and say, there it is, $483. They go, oh, okay. That's how much impact it was having on those members. They didn't even notice they got the money. So we knew it wasn't working. It was financial fitness. So that was the strategy of sharing profits. The idea of helping people, because he's come together. Wait for it, we're going somewhere. Um, the people knew what they had to do, but, and for anybody who works in FI, this is gonna be familiar, right? They felt what they could do was too little to matter. And this is actually, if we use the word financial fitness because it's almost identical to physical fitness. If you look at this, it's almost identical to why people, people know they should be in better shape, same reasons. Can't make a difference too little. They give in to temptation, money goes elsewhere. Uh, put things off, procrastination. I always say to my son who puts things off, don't worry, as a procrastinator, you're a leader of tomorrow. He doesn't get the joke, he will eventually. <laughs> um, they're ashamed of their situation. Uh, and they feel they were failing and avoided thinking about it. So true for physical fitness, true for financial fitness. That's why we kind of put them together. We recognized similar issues, similar solutions. One of the things we concluded, uh, and I don't know if it's even universally in the company yet, but I think we concluded it strongly enough in enough of the, the group to recognize education isn't the key. So I should have mentioned that to the policy class. We're educate, educate, educate. For changing people's financial lives, it's not about education. It's about changing behavior, right? More courses will not make them stop spending the money in their own places. More courses will not make them feel like they don't make a difference. More courses, that's not what you need to get them on the other side of the hill where they actually think that by doing this, they're winning rather than avoiding it. And so we had to figure out a way, if we truly wanted to be doing this for the people we work with, we had to find a way to get them from knowing they should do it to actually doing it. Which by the way, again, if you could can that and sell it for physical fitness, you're gonna make billions. Not an easy thing to do. What did we do? Uh, in the end, the, the answer is we just kept failing. The expression is failing forward. Again, not entirely deliberately, uh, flailing forward. I should have, oh, that's even better. Flailing <laughs> forward is the expression we should use here. We were, we were, what if, what if, could we, what? And so out of this, and, and, and the criteria, and this is the crucial thing, the criteria was if it didn't move the needle, if you couldn't show that people were coming to us because of this, it wasn't what we were after yet. And, and not the five, well, you know, they, they brought us their TFSA. Well, they did last year. Yeah, but this year it was because of our new program. Going, no, they didn't last year. Uh, again, for anybody who worked in any kind of company, there's this tendency to grab the underlying trend of success and slap that on top of whatever you did to justify your behaviors. Rather than the idea is the trend line had to change. Figure out what the trend line is. If the numbers didn't get better than the trend line, this wasn't doing what we were supposed to. Uh, and that was very useful in parsing out the useless stuff, the things that felt good but weren't making a difference. So where we ended up going was, um, and I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go through one of our fails before I go onto that slide. So it, the, this one started with the idea of, could we get people, we're giving them $500 a year, could we get them to start saving the money? 
instead of spending the money. That would start changing their lives. 500 years, because we had whole charts that showed them with, you know, and Carrie's worked with these charts. We showed over 25 years, you would have $15,000 in an RSP as a result of having your mortgage with us. You know, at another institution, you'd have nothing. You'd be starting to make progress and all these kinds of things. Uh, so we had all that. So we thought, ah, we're going we're gonna to call these people and we're going to give them a really smoking deal to, to put the money in a term deposit. Uh, actually, again, human, human conditions, because I just had to. We offered them two, two things. So at the time, GICs were one and a half and mortgage rates were three and three, three, and three quarters. And we wanted to do it, offer a deal such a way of going, you can't miss it. They didn't do it because they didn't want it, not because they didn't like the deal. So we offered them one of two options. We either offered them a GIC at 4%. So they had a one-year GIC at a higher rate than mortgage rates. So if you didn't like that, you just didn't want to save the money. <laughs> Or, and this one fascinated, we offered them a GIC at their going rate of one and a half, but that we would top up by 3%, sort of as an incentive. So if you gave me $1,000, I'll give you 1030 and invest it at one, one and a half percent. So I know not everybody here loves math, but of the two, right, I'm going to give you a 3% bonus on your money, and then you'll earn one and a half, or you can have a one-year GIC earning 4%. What did the people take? 4%, because four is better than one and a half. You're going, no, the other deal's four and a half. <laughs> but it's a fact, it was more complex, it required thought, so whoever wanted took. But the end result is very few people took the deal. So we, we flailed forward there going, damn, that didn't work. Uh, but what came out of it was feedback from the people who talked to the members, and the members said, you know what? If you'd come to me before you gave me the money, I might have actually saved it. But once I had the money, I'd promised myself a trip to Mexico and I wasn't going to give that. I mean, it felt like losing. The, 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 the phrase you heard from a number of people is saving the money felt like losing because I'd already felt like I could do all these things and now he's taking them away from myself. Um, so that was the insight. That was the failure where you went, wait a minute, maybe there's something in that. So the first question was, hey, what if we gave them the money before they expected it on the condition that they put the four or $500 into a GIC? But we also, again, we looked at the, the, the information and told us they weren't reacting to two or three or four or five hundred dollars. I mean, it's, it's frightening to think about in some ways, but that's human beings. They weren't reacting to it. So we came, came about the other way. Ah! The idea of, we're not going to change what we're doing, we're going to change how we did it. And we looked at the idea of, look, we've been telling them over and over that like over five years you're getting like two thousand bucks. You should care. But it was in four or five hundred dollar increments once a year. Never a, a sure thing, right? If the credit union didn't make money, we weren't going to pay them. Um, what if we gave them $2,000 right up front instead? Suddenly, we're not giving $500 eventually whenever, $400 eventually. We're going to give you $2,000 right now. No, over the five years, we're giving it to them anyway. We've been doing this for 25 years. We had a track record. We were barring far bizarre circumstances. It was going to happen. So... To give a sense of that, you think about a financial goal, if you want to stop and think about a financial goal you've got right now, whether it's could be saving for a TFSA, kids RESPs, paying down credit card debt, which by the way, when we launched, when we use this, that is the number one use of the money, is paying down credit card debt. Um, but you think of whatever it is that you're going, God, I really got to make progress. Now, if somebody came and said, I'll give you $2,000, does that change the dialogue from, it's not enough to make a difference, I can't get around to it, I do it when I can, I'm kind of embarrassed, but I don't want to think about it, to $2,000 in your TFSA, in your, in your emergency savings fund. Boom. You know, for most people, that is the emergency savings fund. One. Uh, so that was, that was the pitch. And so when you look at all the reasons people were not behaving, it knocks them all off. So it was, it, we, we, we love the idea. And this is just one of our charts to get that flavor of you know, how much different is it in terms of changing people's lives financially you know, and we were mocking the banks' uh, programs because really all they are is feel-good programs, right? Comfy chairs and penguins and bowler hats. Uh, doing a plan matters. It absolutely matters. But again, to a large extent, you're preaching to the converted, and most people know that. Those who do a plan were ones who are already following through on them anyway. So those who don't want to save money don't want to do the plan. They don't want to talk to you. But to a certain extent, you're, you're really not adding value to the member. They feel good, better for it, but you're not moving their lives. This one changes their lives or can't. And that was a big deal for us of back as a cooperative and things like that. We don't want to just do the right thing per se in terms of looking like it. We really wanted them to be better off. How did it work? Worked pretty good. Um, these are, this is old data, but it was handy and I'm lazy. Um, so the numbers aren't huge. 
But one of the things we loved about it, for those who work in co-ops, 42% of the people who came to us were under 35 years old. And the average book of business from these people was close to $300,000, because usually they were coming with a mortgage. Uh, we tended to get their checking account as well, and not much else because that's all they had. Um, but nonetheless, one of the problems we have as a cooperative and most others is this idea of the aging demographic. Your, 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 your members are all old and, uh, and, and things like that, like me. Uh, but this was effective at reaching a much younger audience. Uh, and they related to it. It solved one of their problems. They liked it. Uh, and in terms of numbers, there's a whole bunch of digits. Uh, the end of the story is, yes, it, it worked. It brought in money. It more than paid for itself in terms of the efforts and things like that. It was, it was financially very successful and operationally very successful. So it, it's happy, it's a win. What we love about it as well, it's, it's based on a cooperative promise that we would keep. The, the problem with best rate competition, unless you're one of those credit unions who can really hold that financial discipline, and they are out there and they're, they're very successful and I envy the hell out of them. Uh, but if you do best rate market most of the time, it's a promise you're not gonna keep. A year from now, two years from now, somebody's gonna have a better rate and that customer is gonna go, our relationship was, you're giving me the best deal. Suddenly you broke the deal. You have a very damaged relationship at that point. The nice thing about this is, we're just gonna keep doing it, because of course it's not, a one, it's not a one time thing. Five years from now, when the mortgage is renewing again, we get to do this again. All right, we got your emergency fund going, what do you, you wanna do now? RSP, what do you wanna work on? And then five years after that, you know, eventually it's paid off, and happy days you're now a saver, and by the way, I probably got it in here, but, um, yeah, I've got it at the bottom. Once they become savers, who do you think they're going to deal with? Because one of the things we found, probably true for a lot of credit unions, is when people transition from being a borrower to being a saver, we often lost the relationship. They often, because they have four or five banking relationships, and lo and behold, they went to whoever else who talked to them first. Talked to them first. We were talking 25 years ago. We've got, now I can't prove it, 25 years, call me and tell me I'm wrong. Uh, but I'm fairly sure 25 years from now, we are their financial plan. There is no debate about who they talk to about their savings. They've already been doing their saving program for 25 years that they wouldn't have otherwise, and it's us. So the only question is now, what do you, what do you want to do with us from here? Uh, so, and based on cooperative differentiation as well, no bank can do this. They can give you a one-time cash back. They can do, we do this every year, every year. And, and in terms of the, 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 the patron advance now, five years, every five years, or three, although everybody wants five years. They want more money up front. So the market members reacted, big deal, that was a big measure. It helped us reach members who knew they should improve but weren't. It's an untapped market, but also something where everyone was failing these people. The banks were and we were, and we got to actually help them win. Uh, it was outcome-based, not activity-based. Again, one of our great sins, and maybe not yours, but boy, we do plans based on activity like you would not believe, but no one wants to commit to outcome. Does this sound familiar? Do you remember having these arguments, Carrie? <laughs> Right? Everybody wants a commitment of spend, nobody wants a commitment of outcome. And the problem with that is, they're not really that deeply committed to the idea it's gonna work. And if you're not committed to it's gonna work, you don't try as hard to make it work necessarily, or look at it hard enough to find out if it truly will work. So it was outcome-based behavior. But, by the way, nothing's ever perfect. Our, our employees don't offer this as often as we thought they would. We're unpacking it, but one of the things we've discussed, well, we kind of knew, but it's a long conversation. It, it is because the first is the, I don't believe you. Then is the, oh, what do I want to do with this? And it tends to be two or three conversations. Now, for anybody who's worked in branches of a credit union or a financial institution, you don't have a lot of time in your life, unfortunately. And so we think our employees avoid this conversation until they think they have time. So the end result is that with what well, we've designed it, we are, we are victims of our own failure there. We don't give them enough time for these kinds of conversations. And so they are self-managing with the environment we created, and they're avoiding this at times. So we're, we're writing them, but nowhere near the pace we thought we would, and we've got to go back and talk to people, but I'm fairly sure the answer we're gonna get is, you want me to sell credit cards with these people, you want me to talk about insurance, you want me to talk about their checking account, you want me to talk about TFSA, and, and, and then, by the way, then you want this, which is, pick a number, a half hour, one hour conversation, two or three times, uh, which is a great thing, and I'll be so happy I did it in five years, but today, I'm really busy. <laughs> so I think that's one of our problems in, in the situation. And there's no fixing the, 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 the conversation time. It's a human thing of I don't believe you, and then, oh, now that I've got choices, what am I gonna do? Um, fewer are saving money than we thought. Most of it's going towards credit card debt. Uh, 
that's still a win if it's playing out the way we had planned it, which is, so Marc-Andre comes, he says, I'm going to pay off my $2,000 credit card debt. What we, what we are supposed to be doing with this is saying, good, you are going to be paying something near of $300 a year just, just to service that debt that we're paying off. Let's save 20 bucks a month, less than the 300 a year. At the end of the year, you're going to have $240. You're, you're, you're paying less than you would have on the interest. You're already winning here. And we're going to take that 240 and we're going to pay down the debt again until it's zero. We're going to keep doing that until it's zero. That's how it should be working. So that was part of the plan is, again, is to move their financial fitness, not just a one-time thanks for the $2,000. Uh, so if it's working well, they are gradually grinding down their credit card debt, not just the first $2,000, but year after year, a little more until it's gone away. And then that's the magic. Now you're saving money, not reducing debt. That's where we're trying to go. Uh, another big problem that we're about to talk to is really it was only effective with people who had large, who had mortgages, you know, 200,000 plus in mortgages, because otherwise your, your patronage advance, when you're paying people $100 a year, it's four or 500 bucks, and you're back to that trap again. Well, that's not big enough to, make, to matter to me. So that was one of the other problems. So it's a win, but you know, if you, you kind of do your quadrants and things like that, it's one quadrant worth of member characteristics or people that we're hitting. That wasn't, that, that certainly wasn't good enough to run an entire credit union on. And also it's sort of the, all right, that worked. Maybe you got lucky. Uh, okay, smart person, do it again. Uh, and so, what do we do for an encore? Uh, the expression we often use is you, you usually win the game on bunts and base hits, not home runs, right? When you swing for the fence, that's often the best way to lose a game in the long run, if you're thinking about more than just a, a single spectacular thing. But it was a solid base hit, and we were pretty happy with it. But how do we reach the smaller balance relationships, right? When, when, you're, when you're 23 years old and you don't have a lot of business with us, how do we reach you when you're a person you know, with the best of intentions, who's got a bunch of their business elsewhere, but they still got a bit with us. How do we reach those kinds of people? You know, how do you get the product more? And, and about, outside of that, the patronage advance is very effective with, with people who are already dealing with us. And we discovered it's also very effective with um, housing development. They love bringing us into the conversation because usually that money that we are able to give them helps offset a bunch of costs of settlement that they hadn't really thought about. So. The people who are building houses actually love us, an unexpected market for us bringing in new. But other than that, most people, again, complex concept, there's no way you're going to explain that in an ad. So how do you reach these people? So we did more, what did we do? We, we flailed and failed some more. <laughs> we, we tried paying patronage and deposits up front. Nope. The reason is, of course, they already had money. They don't care about getting more up front. They're not going to change their behavior for more. If you have $100,000, and I say, I'll give you $1,000 if you'll change your behavior, your answer is, I already had $100,000. And you're going to give me a thousand anyway. Why should I go to any effort? I heard, if I needed money, I'd carve a piece off my hundred thousand uh, bucks. So, and because again, we're not giving the money they didn't have. We're giving it to them sooner and in a bigger lump. People with large amounts of money don't care about that. And certainly not in terms of changing their behavior. Prize link savings. So we did draws like twenty five thousand dollars, saying, you know, put money into your TFSA, and they've been shown to be fairly effective, and they were, right? Uh, but they weren't, I wouldn't even call them bunts in terms of the outcome. They were probably just a better bat boy than we had before. Uh, and so it's, it's a happy thing, but it wasn't changing it. Back to moving the needle, meaningful differentiation. By the way, anybody can do that to a certain extent, right? The 25,000. So it was whole hum. Uh, we, you know, uh, add the patronage advance to the yield on the term deposit. No, it was confusing and, and, and not compelling. We lost people. So we tried all kinds of things. And part of the moral of the story is, we knew what we were trying to accomplish in terms of movement. We had a certain outcome. If it couldn't satisfy that outcome, it helped us go no, 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 which made it very easy to fail quickly uh, and go, not that, not that, not that. And it avoided this whole thing again of, well, that was my beloved idea, and therefore I must justify it by doctoring the data until it says what I want. Uh, it was very black and white of, no, okay, then that's not gonna happen. So same thing again, we're 25 million, it's actually about 30 million we share now. But how can we change the how of our 25 million in annual profit sharing to reach more than large borrowers? Um, the, and, and the challenge there is for so many of our members, they're getting 25 bucks, $15, 100, because it, it, people don't realize it's, you know, the business isn't that profitable. You know, somebody's $500 in savings with us. You know, we're making five bucks a year profit. Well, no, we're making five bucks a year revenue on. Uh, then we've got to pay the depositors, then we've got to pay the admins, so we probably make $1.50 on your $500. I don't know, being complaining, I'm just saying, I don't have a lot of profit to share, and there, I don't get your attention as a result. So what could we do? The idea was really big price-linked savings, which is what we call the big share. So that's, that was the answer. 
So one draw of a million dollars, one member is going to get a million dollars. And here's how we structured it. We built it around our profit. So the intention was to get people to notice that we share profit. So everybody, everybody in the credit union gets a ballot based on the profit share we pay them. So if I pay you $15, you got 15 ballots. You could win. The person whose business only got $15 a year, or $5 a year in profit sharing, they're still in the draw. So it could be that. So th this is very much the human thing of why do people buy lottery tickets knowing the odds? Because the cost of investing isn't very big. Again, the outcome could be very large. And I really don't care about the odds in between because it captures my imagination, which we'll talk about. So the idea was to, to wrap up the idea of the big prize with making people aware of, by the way, I give you money every year. I know it's five bucks a year, but you know what the realization is, they're more excited about five ballots per million than they were about five bucks. Do I care? Not a lot. I just wanted them to be excited about it and realize it was helping their lives. This was helped. So raising the awareness of the difference in the profit sharing, even smaller relationships have the incentive. And also what we felt was certainly if you brought us new money, you got even more. Because again, for anybody who's worked in cooperatives, credit unions, and things like that, they hate deals, rightly so, that says, if you deal with me, you don't get anything. But if you've never dealt with me before, you can have everything you would like. It is so offensive to somebody who spent 20 years building up that credit union. And so this was beautiful. If you dealt with us, you're in. You don't even have to ask for it. You're in. You're, you're in the draw. So the idea was to capture the imagination. Simple. Million dollars. Did you get that? Would you like to win a million bucks? People ask, well, why not 10 prizes of 100,000? Because it doesn't grab the imagination in the same way. What grabs the imagination and drives the behaviors, this could change my life. And 100,000 is nice, but it doesn't end up, there's just magic in a million dollars. You know? And what I said to the board when we pitched it was, the bare naked ladies didn't set, sing if I had $100,000. Uh, there's a reason their song was if I had a million dollars, because it gets people's imagination, even though millionaire isn't what it used to be. Um, is it strong enough to drive an action or reaction and get people savings, grab their attention? And also, by the way, also, we knew the, there's so much noise in the financial space. So many people promising this and promising that, and the promises are all so similar. And we knew that going through this RSPs and it would be, I'm going to help you plan. I've got a great rate. I've got a this. I've got a that. And it just becomes wallpaper to the average human being. This cut through the noise. People noticed that it was so different as a result. So that's what we were after. When people complained to us or raised the question about it and said, what's that about you giving away a million dollars? What we wanted was the answer saying, we don't give away a million dollars. We give away $25 million. The whole point was to get the dialogue going saying, we don't give away a million bucks. We give away 25 million bucks. We just carved a piece off. And if you come deal with us, whether you get the draw or not, you get some of the 25 million. That was the whole point was back to the early thing. Breakthrough, make people aware we're doing this kind of stuff. The other thing like, I loved was the number of people who say, well, this is gambling. It isn't gambling, it's anti-gambling. With gambling, when you're done with a lottery, everybody is poorer except the person who won. With the big share, when you're done, everybody is richer. Either because we paid them profit share on the savings they had with us, or because they started saving money that they hadn't before. Everybody is richer. It's an anti-lottery. And how do we know that? Because in South Africa, where they ran it, lottery sales went down 3%. And as we understand it, the government tried to shut it down initially, because it was cutting into their lottery revenues. That's our understanding. And it's a good story. I'm sticking to it if it's wrong. Um, <laughs> So we love that side of it as well. What was the outcome like? We've really been struggling to raise deposits for ages. Um, and we've tried all kinds. Of, and again, you're looking for something you can do repeatedly rather than the one, one hit wonder that when the money comes due, it all bleeds back out again. So this year, yeah, we, we, we more than doubled our rate of deposit growth in that key season of January to April, which is when we ran the campaign. Uh, and so. And we got the data showing trend lines and everything else. Yeah, especially April. April, $180 million. Just, that's just for Kerry. $180 million in deposit growth in April alone. Uh, so it worked. It, it absolutely worked. And back again to that story. It worked for the member. Every member who participated in this is richer now than they were before. We helped them get from planning or thinking to doing. And they're doing, and we're going to run it again next year, and hopefully they're going to do it again, and they will save, and they will save because of that chance. Uh, the, per the person who won it will be announced in mid-June. Uh, and so we were going, oh, God, don't let it be, you know, you don't, probably don't know Daryl Cates, but he's the millionaire guy who owns the Oilers and everything. Don't let it be Daryl Cates. Uh, and so I do know enough to know it wasn't Daryl Cates. Uh, it, it was a very average member, which is going, yes, <laughs> that's the story we want. It's an average member, and it is going to change their lives. 
right? If somebody was a million dollars, I'm happy for them, but it didn't change their lives. This person, from what I understand of their relationship, it's going to change their lives. Um, and so it's very amateur. Sure we are going to run it again next year. Big share two is coming. Other data, if you care, we saw a 55% increase in our pre-authorized uh, PACs, pre-authorized deposit accounts. These are people who are saving every month. And again, that's, that is our happy space. These are average people. These aren't people with millions of dollars or hundreds of thousands. These are people putting in 50 bucks a month who weren't before. 55% more doing it than were before. And for those who are, are interested in that as well, our ad recall was up 25%, which for a dollar spend is a big deal. The point is it cut through the noise. So, and all of this is, this is sort of the rousy conclusion. Why did I just waste a half an hour of your life? Um, it, it's because we had some ahas out of it because we've been doing this for a long time and hadn't clicked in the same way. And the ones that we found very valuable was focus on the outcome to keep the discipline, right? If it's not moving the needle, it isn't what we were looking for. And you just keep throwing it over your shoulder. Uh, fail forward, small contained failures. That's the other thing. You don't, don't put it all on one. When you put a lot of money, a lot of effort in, people don't want it to fail. They have a vested interest in success and they don't want to acknowledge back to the, listen to the data, don't torture it till it tells you what you want to hear. They're much more likely to torture the data subconsciously. They don't set out to lie to you, but they do lie to themselves. And after that, it's pretty easy to lie to you um, because they can't stand the idea that the idea, of, and, then, and they're uncomfortable going to the board of management going, yeah, I know we spent 500,000 on this, didn't work. Small contains, so the, the first pilot we did, uh, contact center called 100 people. So what did that cost us? I don't know, thousand bucks, something like that. Uh, then we piloted in the branch, we ran it in three branches, cost us 2000 bucks. Uh, so each one was very easy going, well that didn't work, and it was great, so small contained failures. Listen to the member, listen to the market, listen to the data, uh, which is easy to say but hard to do. And, and among other things saying, do you have a means of listening? And so in our case, we already knew what we were gonna measure. It's sort of that, that listening goes back to the focus on the outcome is, do you know what success is supposed to look like? If you don't, I got a good guess why you're struggling with finding something that drives the outcome you're seeking. Um, we were very we were very guilty of that ourselves. We would run campaigns going, well, we're gonna we're gonna measure member awareness. It was such a vague thing, and it was so victim to the what happened in life and who was on TV at the time that when we got data, if the data was weak, we'd say, yeah, but there were mitigating circumstances. At which point, as soon as it was strong, people like me said, ah, 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 you can't claim the upside when you said you didn't own the downside. At which point it was a waste of everybody's time. This wasn't, right? Either the numbers were there or they weren't. There's no doubt that sometimes this also takes us outside our comfort zone. Uh, so the journey on the big share especially was so fun because we quickly picked out, everybody went through the same journey. And it was, so by the time we got to the board, we were more than ready for it. So the journey was always one of the first thing is what? Then it was the, no, no, that doesn't, it doesn't feel like a credit union. That doesn't feel right. We shouldn't be doing something like this. Then it was the one, sh one person shouldn't get that kind of money. That's just, not, it's gambling. It's, so it, it was all of those things until you kind of walk them through the, we don't care that it's one person. What we care is 3,000 people started saving who didn't. If the price of that is you seeing one person get a million dollars, get over yourself. We haven't found any other way to get 3,000 people saving money like that. So don't get so hung up on your own attitude and values and think about the member, because that's actually who it's about. And so as you went, they started getting more excited, saw the potential, and, and so it was this weird journey of the, of the dis discomfort and then disagreement with the concepts. And then up, and everybody, uh, Caroline went through it, who was the chief operations person at the time. Uh, Michelle, who was marketing, went through it. The CEO, Garth, went through it. By the time we went to the board, we actually showed them the graph going, by the way, while I'm talking, you're about to go through this journey. <laughs> and we laid out exactly what the journey is going to be before we explained the idea. And then we were done. They all went, yeah, we, we went through that journey. But it certainly was taking you out of the comfort zone. Um, and I think from here, it's just a whole bunch of smart-ass slides. I could be wrong. Uh, but, but this is, the group saw a different one, but there's a similar concept, which is, uh, we so often as cooperatives, we talk about our vision, our purpose, or this or that, but there's no meaningful execution, certainly not execution to outcome. And it, it's, a, it's a good quote, this idea of, I, I know I've got the other one, which is, what is it? Uh, it's not quite the same as the Morris guy, but it's, it's like strategy without execution is a dream, execution without strategy is a nightmare. Uh, cleverer than the other one I shared with you guys. But it's all the same idea of looking at yourself and saying, is that, am I in that spot, right? Am I feeling so good talking about my vision and what I could be and should be that I'm not paying attention to whether I truly am? Service was very much there 
I think was willing to confront the fact that it isn't happening. For all of us talking about how much difference we shared, we shared over the course since our creation, including our dividends in the Middle East, we've shared almost three quarters of a billion dollars with the people of Alberta just since we were created, what, 15 years ago? That sounds great, but if they don't care, you're only a quarter of the way down the journey. Because if they don't care, I'm not in a position to do it for the next 15 years. So I love that they got the money, but my demand date was bigger than that. And so where were we fulfilling it? Yeah, these are all these are all just my 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 my, my slides. But some things that we felt victim of. One of the things was we would compare our data to other people who were struggling and say, "Oh, we're doing better than that," right? So it's the tallest Hobbit in the Shire kind of bragging, which is it's very effective at, at fooling board members. That kind of selective benchmarking is extremely good at keeping scrutiny and pressure off yourself, and we did it a lot. Again, we believed it. We looked at, "Oh, we're so much better than X Y Z credit union." That's not the benchmark. The benchmark is whether the market is coming to you more often for what you did. Uh, yeah, and, and, and so this, this, is not, this is now CFO lecturing. Uh, work hard to grow the amount available for your profit of difference, right? When you're spending the money on things that don't matter uh, to the member, no kidding, the member didn't notice it. You know, if we were giving every member a penny, it's pretty hard to say that's going to be a difference. And if you did a big share against it, how much have we got to share? $400,000. Uh, and so one of our mandates to make this work had to be the get your costs under control so that whatever's left for that more than enough is a big enough number. Maybe I've got a slide that complains about it here. I do. Um, our problem is, was it so thin, the credit difference, that nobody could see it because the money was, was being consumed by inefficiency, consumed by spending on things that we were interested in, but the member didn't react to. And there's space for those kinds of things when you're winning the big game. Right? When you're winning the big game and they're all coming in the door, you can carve off a piece and use it for a greater social good, and you should. But you've got to be winning because if the machine isn't throwing off money, where's it coming from? If, the, if more members aren't coming in next year because of the difference you made in their lives, where's the money coming from for these other ideas? So you've got you to grow that kind of stuff. Um, and doing this, there's no doubt, good strategies, more about no than it is about yes. We said no to a ton of ideas that people had because he just looked and said, not in the space. Not a, is it moving financial fitness and this at the same time? No, don't do it then. I just need idea. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Highly unpopular. Um, yeah, this is, this is just more rah-rah. If it was easy, it wouldn't be so fascinating, which is true. I don't know about you, but it fascinates me. The easy stuff isn't interesting. This is cool. And when it works, admittedly, it is really neat. Uh, but this is, it, it, it's, it's and, and, and what I used to say to the managers, if it was easy, we wouldn't pay you to do it. Because uh, they'd complain sometimes, going, well, this is, it. if it was easy, you know, well, I can pay you minimum wage for easy. Uh, but if you want that kind of money, I'm going to make you act, try to take on these kinds of problems. Yeah. This is just, this is, this is not work, but that's my definition of enough. I love used bookstores. Actually, I was going to go, there's a used bookstore over by, <laughs> but it was closed over by, the, ho by the, the Holiday Inn there. I was going to go wandering in. So I'm, I'm kind of done. I can just show all kinds of slides that discuss <laughs> where I thought our, feel, our, our weaknesses were, our problems were. These are all ones I did for my retirement, mocking myself and the company. So that's great, Ian. Thank okay. you so much. I have time for questions. In the meantime, I'll just keep scrolling the slides <laughs> for my for my amusement, if not yours. So, folks, have questions. Yeah, so I have a couple of questions. Um, yes, you, sir. <laughs> yeah, what about the the taxation side of things, right? So, your patronage payments yep. are deductible, correct? Uh, were these patronage deductible, and and were they taxed on the member side? Okay. Did they get the payment? So, the patronage on loans is not taxable in the hands of the member. From the government's perspective, rightly so, it's seen as a reduction in the interest they pay. Okay. So when I pay you the $2,000 patron advance, tax-free. There's Perfect. no tax associated. And you don't get a deduction from that? Or do you um, yes, we, well, it's, it's, it's an expense. It's, it's an expense. Yes. So yes, we do get a deduction okay. because it's a reduction in our revenues. Right. So we, we, we pay less. Uh, patronage on a deposit is taxable in the hands of the member. Uh, so anything we did on the deposit was also taxable in our hands, which made it more com complex. I wasn't involved in this part of it. The legal opinion we have is the million-dollar award is not taxable. 
And so whoever gets a million, it is tax free. They got a tax opinion on it, and that's all I'm looking for in life. Uh, so I'm not going to debate it, but the million dollar reward actually is not, no matter where their ballot came from, depositor alone, it's not taxable. Because I think it's a prize link on certain award, they don't have to pay taxes on it. I mean, it's that could be it. <laughs> yes. No, that's not true. In Vegas, don't they take their tuck, cut a tax out of you before you leave the state if you win? Oh, is that, oh, now, is that for all or just the federal lotteries? All? all okay. So, so much I played lotteries. <laughs> I, my expression is I, I like to lose my money in the stock market instead. I understand it better and the odds are good. That's <laughs> yeah. yeah. You talked about the 25% increase in brand awareness. Yes. What's the brand awareness point going into the... No idea whatsoever. I just pulled the stats from the, the summary. I don't work there anymore. <laughs> so I just went in, I, I got a hold of, uh, uh, Dion sent me, who's a new CEO, I said, can I get a copy of the results? Because I want to share with people how we did. Um, and so I just, those were the results. So I, I'm going to guess, it's usually what we're measuring if people care is unaided, unaided brand awareness, because that's the really meaningful one of saying, hey, when you think of financial institutions, who do you think of? And rather than, you know, maybe a credit unit, you know what I mean? Um, Unaided brand awareness is just that naked question, and I'm going to guess unaided would have been something like 14%, and it went to 20, kind of a thing, or 17 or 18. That that's most likely because our un, our unaided brand awareness is not 90%. It's 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 lower. So that's so it wasn't 25% like going from 14 to 39. It was 25% like 14 to 17, kind of a thing. 25% Yes. What about the what about the uh, sorry what about the the risk you talked and you kind yeah. of alluded to this right that a millionaire gets picked or something yeah. like how did you you were willing to live with that like, obviously yep. um, that back to something? the comfort zone thing of going ooh this could look ugly yeah if my sister had won right I would have been so happy for her but as the person who actually pitched it to yes. the board awkward yes. yeah but I wasn't going to try to get it away from it you kind of that goes through your head though right if if yeah, if, uh, yeah, if Dion's brother had one, you know, if, if somebody associated with one of the seats, so the rules were the board couldn't win, employees couldn't win, uh, people living in their houses couldn't win. So those were definite no-nos. We'd already gone through going, that, that just looks bad. People, uh, live, people who live in the houses of the employees, so children and oh, things. So my son Graham lives in Calgary, he can win. My son Sam lives with us, he can't win. Okay. So the, the whole point was to make sure there was no appearance at all of employees, yes. yes. Yeah, board members, I would suspect board members as well, that anybody living in the house of the board member also could not win. Yeah, I, I, I. now for the employees, we did a mini draw, not for the board members or senior executive, uh, but we did a mini draw based on, again, same criteria, uh, their, how much profit share they had with us, but that was mainly because it felt really cruel to go, million dollars, not for you. <laughs> so we, we did a draw of something Here, for them. I have a question. Yeah. Um, when you're talking about outcomes, if the outcome was for people to understand that you gave away $25 million yeah. a year, um, but only brand awareness went up by 25%, yeah. how many people understand that you gave away more than a million dollars and actually did that 25 million? Yeah, and the simple answer is still nowhere near enough. This is, this is progress, not success. This so, is not the end of game. So that, is there, have you developed a way to track that? Other than walk, things like this unaided brand awareness and seeing if it's getting better when we run the campaign versus when we don't, because we will we'll do another survey of members in six months, I don't know, when we don't have all the ads going on the big share. If our thesis is correct, it will fall off a bit because they're not noticing it. But what should happen is, like a sawtooth, it should sawtooth gradually upwards. So, and so um, I was also interested when yeah. you said that the um, savings went up. Or the pot, your deposits went up, and yep. was that for new money coming in and members saving money? Yeah. So the, the the number I showed you, the 363 million dollars, was our net growth in deposits in the in the period from January to April. So and that was when the campaign. Ran. That was when the campaign ran. So, they, so they that saved money so that they could get another ballot. Uh, some brought money to us. Some people were with us already and started saving. So some were new members. Some, uh, and so the 360 million dollars was all it's hard to sift out. I'd have to go back and see how much left us versus versus came. And for those who've ever worked with, your problem is with, check, with checking accounts, but I can tell you on a net basis, that's what we use. On a net basis, we had 360 million more 
at the end of April on deposit than we had at the, at the, at the beginning of January. That in turn was 100, what, almost 190 million more than we had grown in the same period the year before. And 100 and, and 200 and 20 million more than we had the year before that. Great, so, so it's more like 190 million. Because you, yes. You're crazy. Yep. Anyway. That is correct. So it's more like 100 million. Yep. So there would have no incentive for them to do that other than to get a ballot. Correct. And so it didn't matter whether they had already had 500,000 on the ballot or $2. They saved more. They got more. So if they had 500000 on deposit, they would have had, I'll do the math on it now, uh, they've got 600 and 650 ballots because they would have got $650 in profit share on their deposits. Actually, more than that. But anyway, call, call it $650. Because, again, the, the way it worked is whatever we had paid them in profit sharing the year before, every dollar of that, I think, was a re, that, that was certainly what I'd recommend when I built it up, became a ballot. So if you dealt with us, the profit sharing you got in the last year all became ballots, counted as ballots. If you brought us new money, that counted as more ballots. So if they took a mortgage over in that time period, that would count as well. Uh, if, they, if they had a mortgage last year and we paid them profit sharing on it, that counted as ballots. <laughs> yep. So it's very possible the person who won actually was a borrower, not a depositor. How many members did you get? That you might have said this, but I missed it. I, you know, I, the number I saw was 6,300 new members, but I didn't include it because I didn't have the stats for what our net growth in membership was the year before. So I can't, to your point about the 360 versus, yeah, you're right. When we talk to the board and the employees, we say 190 million, and that's why we showed you the, the, the doubling. Uh, same, I can't give you the stats as to whether 6,300 is good or bad. I think it's a good number. Um, but I, you know, we, well, you, over three months, four times 24,000 a year, that's a 6% membership growth. Yeah, that's a good number. Uh, there's no way we were running like that before, but I don't have the data to give it context, so I left it out. Sorry. So this is, I mean, there's obviously lots of factors in the question I'm both ads, capacity, but, um, so I, I mean, I come from a credit union where we, we don't pay patronage like that, right? Yep. So why not just take that $25 million invested in having the best mortgage rate and best deposit yep. rate in town, and wouldn't that, build, wouldn't the people come from, hypothetically, Rushing to the yeah. door. Yeah, and, and the answer is we know they won't uh, because if you look at the amount we're paying, we pay, uh, I would say, 16 basis points, about one sixth of a percent in patronage on your mortgage, and we pay about 20 basis points, about one fifth of a percent on your deposits. And we know from experience that doesn't get a reaction out of people, it's too small. So if the bank's deposit rate is 3% and we're paying 320, not that many people actually can be bothered to walk across the street. If the bank rate is is four percent on a mortgage and ours is you know three eighty two, they they don't tend to react. So we're and I can't speak for Affinity. I can speak for Cambrian uh, because I look, Cambrian they run their credit in such a way. So you know way back to that credit in difference. Way back if I can get their slide their after all. Their efficiency is low. They, yeah. they, they their efficiency is hugely below mine, which shows me there's a credit union that is deeply committed to their differentiation and living the, the creation of it. Uh, there we are. So their, yeah, their, their credit difference, the, the, what they need, the enough they need to be successful is way down here, which means they're able to give away great incentives, way up there. They just, they just beat the hell out of me. They're just way better than I am at that. At, and, get a different CFO and maybe we can do more of that at service. That's as far as I could go in terms of working with us. That's, that's, that's the limitation of my skill. Um, and so that, that's the truth of it, right? Which is, you know, when you're, when the world gives you lemons, um, you're, 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 you're kind of stuck with lemons. Um, so when the world, when the world gave service credit to me as the CFO, that's as far as I could get us. Uh, and so to your question, yeah, an eighth of a percent, a fifth of a percent, not enough to move the behavior, the chance at a million dollars, enough to move the behavior. Had I built like Tom has built in Cambrian, uh, then I'd stick with his strategy probably because when you can do a quarter, three eighths of a percent, half a percent better, oh yeah, yeah, they get that gets their attention. Yeah, so what, what we did at Affinity though is we got that we used that stopping in the passion to start by yes. putting on our path to be lower efficiency. Yeah. And we're going down and down. Perfect. We, we yeah. have to do a whole bunch of other things. Yep. 
uh, but that was the easy first step. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, but yeah, all those things you said, you know, yep. they tested it, and yeah. nobody gave a rat's Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And so it, we, we were a couple of steps away from doing the same thing. We just said, you know what, we got to give it one more try to see if we can find a different way. You know, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing and expecting different results. We were doing the same thing year after year. So had we not succeeded, we would have gone down a path like yours or something well, like I that. I can do an index link mortgage. Yep. Uh, the sure index yep. linked whatever you were talking about, the, the, what they do in Australia. You mentioned oh, price and savings? Price yes. Savings yes. Now yes, you can. And, and, and then we have the money from the patrons that we're not getting on either. True. So yes, you could. So you could yep. do the same thing. Yeah, I, I am not at all saying. The, the only difference, and it's not a criticism, is no. the million dollars for us is tied up in the idea of profit sharing. So it's reinforcing the message of we're different than a bank. We share our, so it, it's a way of saying we share our profits and they don't. Uh, is that the be all and end all? Absolutely not. But it's just observing, it ties into our strategic differentiation and that's yeah. why it was a big deal to us. But no, if as a cooperative, if you can make your differentiation a compelling deal on the street, I don't know why you'd go away from it because that is the single easiest determinant people use to say who will I who will I do business with, and, and I'm not going to criticize it. The only impediment to it is they don't necessarily get you did it because you were cooperative. And how big of a deal is that? You know what? If they keep coming to deal with you, I don't think it's that big of a deal. <laughs> but it's it's not as obvious that it, you did it because you're cooperative. They go, well, you know, Tangerine does that too. Uh, I'm not criticizing it because in the end, if it's working. Who cares if people like me go, well, is it really showing your difference? Uh, if they're coming in, they're, they're wealthier for it, which they are, they're getting a better deal. Uh, it's helping you sustain and grow. You're winning. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't, I'd go, I wouldn't go messing with that. That's success. That's what we're trying to get to. If you guys are, 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 are clicking on those cylinders with affinity, you're where we're still trying to go. So this is just our journey of how do we get from kind of going sideways to somewhere? Yeah, it was good. We were, we were very interested in yeah. To find out what was going on? <laughs> yeah. And you're right, if you don't do profit sharing, you could still do the large price link savings. And our experience was, admittedly, they marketed it very well. They, the people involved did such an awesome job of this. But for all, it worked. For us, it absolutely worked. The staff loved it. Uh, you know, Carrie White, who used to work, uh, our, our, um, I'm losing his name already. Uh, Daryl White. He used to talk about the service swagger, right? You know, your employees kind of doing the, yeah, we're pretty good. Damn, we're good. Uh, that gave them more swagger. Uh, and so I, I, they probably already have it with Affinity because they know they got the better deal on the street. But for us, it was nice to have that swagger again where people people were coming up and going, you guys are doing that thing. That is cool. It's it's nice to have. And so it's, it's good to, and, and to, you have it because the market cares. Differentiation that made a difference. In your case, you've got it already. That's a nice place to be. And we'll take one more question. If uh, people have it. Carrie, go ahead. Yeah. In, is there a percentage of the so that credit union difference? Is there yeah. a percentage of that that is then regenerated back in the profit share every year? So you talked about three quarters. We yep. Yeah. So we we don't. Oh, this is getting detailed. Um, we don't uh, target how much goes into our profit sharing as a percentage of 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 what we've earned and things like that. Uh, we look at uh, what our return on asset needs to be in order to generate enough capital to sustain an ongoing growth rate. Because as a, as a financial institution, you're not allowed to grow if you don't have capital to support it. And so the way we look at it is we have to be making enough profit to generate enough capital to let me grow again for the next five to 10 years because it's not very credit union to go to a member and say, you can't do a loan with us, we don't have enough capital anymore. So our model is more predicated on the, do we have enough after all the spending we need to do on technology and blah, 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 that amount of profit then has to be enough to make sure that we have capital, we run a 10-year model uh, over the next 10 years to sustain our, our growth rate. And then what we try to do is a profit share payment to people that we think we can sustain over the next five plus years because we don't want to be yanking it around all the time. So we kind of look, and so we, we tweak it every few years if it, as it needs it, but we're trying to execute a very smooth if you have three hundred thousand dollars with us, or a hundred thousand, whatever you got last year, and this year, and next year, look roughly similar. Consistency builds loyalty and understanding. Inconsistency creates confusion and disengagement. So, it's it, it's not a 
formula saying this percentage of profit always so if we make twice as much we'll pay twice as much it's a longer game that we try to smooth out perfect thank you so much oh, Ian. I appreciate it